can have a seat. Yeah. One of the biggest blessings that, that I get, one of the ways that the Lord speaks, I think, into me is when I stop singing and I hear the congregation singing. To me, that's just, it's just awesome the way the Lord worships it. And so I hope there are times, not everybody needs to stop singing at the same time because it would kind of kill the vibe, but if every once in a while you just stopped and you just heard uh, the cloud of witnesses singing praises to the Lord, it might change perspectives on that. Uh, once again, I'm so thankful for the kids and the youth and the families that are here today. Thank y'all for being here and for everyone else to be here as well. I want to talk to you uh, today about a Christian fling or pilgrim. Are we, are we having a Christian fling or are we a Christian pilgrim? I'll let you sit on that for a little bit and think about where this is going to go. But Christian fling or pilgrim, I want to pray for you. And as I'm praying for you, it'd be so kind and so generous if at the same time you'd be praying for me. I'm, I'm praying for you, and I would love it if you'd pray for me as well. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. You are the King of kings, and you are the Lord of lords, and you are so generous, and you are so kind, and you are so relentless in your pursuit of each and every every person in this room and online. God, we pray that you will awaken those of us who are asleep. That you will comfort those who need to be comforted. That you will challenge those of us who need to be challenged. And that your grace will abound. Lord, we thank you ahead of time for what it is that you are going to do within these next few moments. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Christian fling or Christian pilgrimage. So, so fling means a couple of different words before we get into the scriptures here. Fling means a, a few different things. So if you get a flat rock and you stand at the shore or the bank of a creek or a, or a pond and you get it, you fling a rock, right? And it, if you do it right, the joy is that the rock skips upon the water and maybe goes three or four times and then it goes kerplunk and that's, that's it. But but it's all pretty much surface level. The, the point is not to have a high arch to where it just drops once. It's to, to do it in such a way that it skips, but it's staying surface level the whole time. That's a fling. Another way to, to understand fling is if, uh, you, know, if, if you have a, a momentary experience with someone else that you need not be spending time with. We have kids in the room, so I just went all the way around there. So a, a fling, you know, is not just a rock seeping across the water. It's like you're, you're doing something casually that uh, for the experience, it feels great. It sounds great. You think it's great. You can justify it in your mind, but it's a fling. And it usually has no positive return whatsoever. Uh, but you're doing it for the experience because it feels good and you're doing it. Uh, you can also say instead of a fling, uh, it's very experiential. You can almost say it's, it's very much like a tourist. Uh, a tourist goes not for the, for the depth of the experience, but to experience just surface level things. Like last year, we did a lot of traveling and we went to uh, Chicago. That was one of the places that we went. And we wanted to experience, we wanted to have a fling with Chicago, if you want to use that term. So we, we made no investment in Chicago. We weren't in it to have a long-lasting relationship with Chicago. Uh, we weren't going to stick around Chicago, but we just wanted the experience. So one of the things we did is we, we did a tour, a boat tour that was an architectural tour of Chicago right through the, whatever that river is, through Chicago. And so we were on the boat for like an hour, maybe an hour and a half, and it was a great experience, but it was a fling. We heard all about the architecture, all the great places to eat. It was wonderful. We had a great experience, but we made no investment in Chicago whatsoever. A little bit later, we drove up to Lambeau Field in Wisconsin. Uh, raise your hands if you're loud and proud Green Bay Packers fan. <laughs> yeah, my wife and uh, one or two others maybe. So anyway, so we went, and it was a great experience. Uh, that was a place that we, Michelle wanted to go, but we were actually just having a fling with Lambeau Field. It was just surface level. We're not playing the games. We're not really invested in the organization. Uh, we like watching the TV when they play, but we're, like, we didn't put down roots there. 
It was a fling. It was like a rock seeping across the water. And, and just a few, like next week, uh, my oldest daughter Hannah and I were going out to Guadalupe Peak out in West Texas, God's country, between Carlsbad, New Mexico, and El Paso. There's the t- high, uh, highest peak in Texas. I think we got a picture of it right there. It's, it takes about nine hours from once you start walking to go to the top and then come back. And it, I think it raises like a million feet. I think that's how far, that's how far it goes. And uh, I think I'm pretty close to that. And so, but we're going for the experience. We're not invested in that part of the world, but it's an experience that we're going to have. And I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to spend time with my oldest daughter. But then also, I'm an old man. I'm looking forward to coming back and going, I conquered that thing as an old man and my knee hurt the whole time. So I'm looking forward to it, just bragging rights, you know. But it's, it's, it's a fling. It's casual. It's momentary. It's all about the experience. Jesus doesn't call you to have flings with him. Or in your walk, he he calls you to be on a pilgrimage with him. And that's something different. Pilgrimage is where you're you're in it and you're right in the middle of something. And in the middle of that something, God's really doing something for you. It's not the destination. It's not the beginning point. It's right in the middle that things are taking place. For example, if you go to to Mark chapter 9, and and I'm going to hit on verses 30 through 50, but I just want at the very beginning to hit this first part. It's about a journey. It's about a pilgrimage and about how the disciples kept on thinking it was about a fling and not a pilgrimage. So they, the disciples in Jesus, left that place where they were and they passed through Galilee. Just imagine it's like we, we left and we passed through Crescent and we got stopped at the train. Okay, so we're passing through Crescent. And Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. So he was using this as a teaching moment. He was stopped at the train. He used this as a teaching moment, not to look at his phone, not to scan the radio stations, but to visit with the people in the car. Okay? Yep. And he said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant, and they were afraid to ask him, right? And so I just want you to pick up on this, and, and then they came to Capernaum, which is another place. So I want you to pick up on what's happening here. Jesus with his disciples are going from one place to the other, and he's really dropping a lot of hard things in their lives right now. He's going, look, this isn't just about the different experiences, because they had been around him when he was doing miracles, when he was saying some pretty awesome things, where people's lives were being transformed, where, where people were being delivered from, from demon possession. I mean, these were all like experiential things, right? And and he's looking at them and he goes, look, there's something deeper going on here. It's not about the experience. It's about the pilgrimage. So he's going from Galilee and he's going to Capernaum and he's actually on his way to Jerusalem. Now, for many of us, we're like, Jerusalem, I don't even, what's the big deal about that? The big deal about that is that in seven weeks, we're going to celebrate Easter. And Easter culminates in Jerusalem. So between now and seven weeks, we're going to finish up our time with, with Mark and we're going to end at the resurrection. Now, now we've been on Mark actually for about nine months. That, that hasn't been a rock skipping across the water time with Mark. Uh, that hasn't just been a cool experience, Mark. It's like we've been digging into it, and some of us are like, from the very beginning, like how, like really, how long are we spending time in Mark? Like you can really, you can really stretch nine months out of Mark? And I'm like, yeah, we can. Challenge accepted. Let's go for it. And because we're, we're trying to do a pilgrimage, not just have the cool experiences, but to dig in right into the middle of sometimes where it's the gray area, where the wrestling takes place. And this is what's happening with Jesus and his disciples. He's saying, look, it's not just about the experience. It's not just about the, the, the bells and whistles. He goes to the disciples, look, it's a pilgrimage. And you've really got to wrestle, for example, to the disciples on this pilgrimage. Look, you, what does it mean for you that I'm going to die and be resurrected on your behalf? A tourist doesn't have to dig in like that. They're just there for the experience. But a pilgrim takes time and goes, well, that's really big. Like, that's not just about the experience. That's not just a quick answer. That's like, how do I spend a lifetime living into that? A a tourist, let me go back to a tourist here just a second. A tourist is, is, they look at the world around them and they go, man, this world is phenomenal and I want to experience every bit of it. And I'm like, yeah, 
but they look at the experience and they go, that, that is really what's important. A pilgrim looks at the world that they are in and go, this world is not the way that God intended it to be. And so a pilgrim looks at the world and goes, I, I am not of this world. The world's pretty awesome, but it's also really messed up in a lot of ways. When there's wars, rumors of wars, pain, death, sin, shame, the whole litany of things that are going on, a pilgrim looks at that and goes, this is not what God intended. A tourist or someone having a fling looks at the world and says, the world is my oyster. Let's get every bit of it. But a pilgrim goes, no, there's something more to that. So Jesus, when he's saying, look, you you need to understand that I'm actually going to die on behalf of you and others so that you might live. That's a pilgrimage. You got to get right in the middle and figure out what that, what that means. He then goes on to say, and and, you know, it's kind of like blow after blow while they're still at the light in Crescent waiting for the train to pass. Like they're waiting for this conversation to stop. He only talks about how he's predicting his death and they're like, I don't even know what that means. But he's also talking about uh, clarifying what it means to be the greatest among them. In, in, our, in our household, our 10 and 12-year-old, we alternate days as to who gets the front seat. It's always a really peaceful process in the mornings, you know. <laughs> it's like peace and harmony and love every morning. They, they're always so respectful of one another. Brother, I believe it's your day. <laughs> Sister, would you like to take a seat in the... And, and many times... I have to make sure that, that Jesus has got control of my mouth and my heart and my face because I'm like, y'all just got to get in this car. Let's go, <laughs> right? And so imagine you're at the stoplight at Crescent and Jesus is in the car and, the, and you, along with the other kids, are going, hey, Jesus, which one of us is your favorite? And Jesus is going, yeah, okay, you have no idea what this means. You know, and a tourist is going, look, I, what do I, what, or someone who's having a fling of the experience, how can, I, how can I have the best experience with the least amount of cost and the least amount of sacrifice on my behalf? A pilgrim goes, I just want to spend time with Jesus. But the disciples at that time, as they were trying to re- be reminded over and over again that they were on a pilgrimage, kept on thinking it was about the tourist experience or the fling. Because they were asking Jesus, Jesus, who do you think is the greatest? And he said, look, if you, let me put this in perspective, kids. Whoever you think that you're the first, you're actually at the end of the line. And for those of you who think that you're at the end of the line and that no one even notices you, you're actually at the front of the line. Because in God's economy... It's not a matter of who talks the loudest. It's not a matter of years served. It's not a matter of any of that. What's the matter of is making sure that we are following one person and that he is the way and the truth and the life. And after we make sure that we're in alignment with him, everything else will fall into place. But if we are like, I've got to get first because of entitlement, because of age, because of money, because of experience, because you just don't like being second place, then he's coming back to you and go, you fall into the trap of tourism or having a fling. And actually, this is about pilgrimage. The first shall be last, so get behind me. And I think it's really important that this is a good word for the Christians in the church. Because Christians in the church fall into the same trap that the disciples did years ago. You know, we look at our time served in the church and we go, well, they should know how long I've been in the church. Or people should know how much we give or we don't give, right? Or we think we know more because of of just experiences and Jesus goes, hey, as long as that's glorifying the Lord, then phenomenal. But this isn't a tenured track here. This is a matter of who's following in the proper alignment. So he's talking about he's got to die, but he's also talking about the position like you always fall behind Jesus, right? But then he's also talking about, if you continue in Mark chapter 9, he's also uh, talking about, you know, what it means to, to, to make sure that you're responsible for other people. Once again, we're still stopped at the light at Crescent where the train is going. And he's still talking to us, and it's like, okay, I've got to die for you. It's not a matter of who's, who gets the front seat or not. It, it's really about kids. It's about how it is that you're responsible for others. A tourist is not interested in how it benefits other people. I can tell you that when we went to Chicago, we didn't book a hotel room by first asking, hey, does anyone else want this room? Because if you do, then you get it first. 
We, we just want to be humble servants. No, we went to Chicago, got our room, and if someone couldn't find a room, we were like, sorry about you, you should have got online earlier, right? But Jesus is saying a pilgrim looks at things differently and says, look, it's not just about your experience. It's about making sure that you don't cause someone else to stumble. Now, I think that's a really one of the most interesting pieces of Christianity or following Christ that kind of gets lost is we many times think it's about us, but Jesus keeps on saying, look, you have to be responsible for your walk with me. And if your walk with me is going to cause someone else to stumble, then you need to stop, especially if you're aware of it. A pilgrim on the journey is not only looking out for themselves, but they're looking out for other people on the journey also. Someone who's having a Christian fling, just in it for the experience, just doing the touristy experience, that doesn't necessarily mean they're looking out for other people. Jesus calls you to be a pilgrim, not a tourist. And the last thing he says back at the, at the end of, of Mark chapter 9, as he's, once again, we're still stopped at the light in Crescent. And he says, look, you've you got you to make sure that you're salty. Like, be salty, like, but in a good way. Have y'all ever met somebody who's salty and like, a, like they're a prickly pear, like they're a cactus, and you, just, you don't even want to get close to them because they'll poke you. And they're just, you're just one word away from them just vomiting all over you. They're kind of salty. they got an attitude about them. Jesus says, yeah, have an attitude, but have the, hum- the attitude of a humble servant. And to be salty in such a way that wherever you go, you're, you're adding God seasoning to things. Like you're representing me. This is what it means to be a pilgrim. That means you're looking after yourself. And you're making sure that you're also looking after others. And you're making sure that you understand the influence that you have. That you are not your own anymore, but that you are a pilgrim of Jesus. A tourist. If even, let me just ask this. Ever, anyone ever been on a vacation? Are you taking some time away because you know you deserve it? And you went to a restaurant and you got bad service. Yeah. And because your pastor wasn't there and no one else from your church was there, so no one knew. You're almost like a spy. You were flying undercover. You got bad service or you had a bad experience and you were the wrong kind of salty to somebody. Anyone? Mm, people, y'all are in the house of the Lord. Please do not, do not test the Lord on that. But that's what he's saying. Look, pilgrims, pilgrims understand the right kind of salty. Now, with that being said, I love going on trips and I love experiencing things. I do, and I know many of you do as well. There's nothing necessarily wrong with going on trips and experiencing things, except when there is something wrong with it. Except when that becomes a norm, especially in your Christian walk. What can happen with us, and this is the tension that we have to keep in mind, is that for some of us, and Christians in general, some of us are Christian tourists. We pop in every once in a while for the religious experiences, but we have no investment. We're not really concerned about thinking about what it means for Jesus to live, die, and be resurrected for us. We still operate as if it's our job to be at the front of the line. We're still not thinking about how we are being called to be responsible for other people. And actually, we're the wrong kind of salty. And Jesus, like he's told the disciples, said, I've created you for more than that. Like, be on this journey with us. We're seven weeks away, guys, from the resurrection. And just like he was trying to do with the disciples, he's trying to do with us to get us outside of the tourist line and onto the, the trail of being a pilgrim. Because that is where life is found. Not just in the experiences, but the life with Jesus. So I, w- I want to pray for you today. And when we pray, uh, I'm going to be praying for you, but, but I know you understand it's not just about receiving prayers from the pastor. For many of you, you know that, hey, at that same time, you can ignore me, and you can be praying for the person sitting next to you. You can also be praying for uh, people who are sitting next to you, but people who come to your mind because the Lord places that person on your heart. You see, you're, you're, you're making sure you're in alignment with the Lord and you're not just focused on you, but you're trying not to be a stumbling block to someone else, but you're trying to be the right kind of salty. See, I, I, I trust that because the Lord is kind and he's generous and he's good, his spirit's gonna be testifying to your spirit and you, even you, can pray right now. Because you're all striving to be pilgrims, not just having Christian flings. 
So let's pray. And I'm going to see if, how the Lord's going to guide us. And then uh, let's see what happens with it. And we'll stop when it's time to stop, and we'll go when it's time to go. That sound all right? All right, let's see, let's see. If you wouldn't mind, if you're comfortable with it, just kind of closing your eyes and bowing your heads, or you can look up at the ceiling, whatever you want to do. But we'd encourage you to maybe put your hands out like you're going to receive something. And uh, for the kids and the youth in the room, that might be something that's super helpful, like you're going to receive something. So, Almighty God, we thank you for your powerful and your awesome love. We thank you that you desire that none of us would miss out on what it is that you have for us. God, for, for those of us, no matter how old we are, we've really just been focusing on the experiences. God, would you, would you call us deeper? God, I, I thank you that you were going to place on our hearts those of us who, who are ready to become pilgrims and not just consumers. God, would you place that in our hearts right now? Because I know that you are faithful and you already have these folks in your sights right now. God, would your spirit testify to their spirits, even if they're six or eight or 10 or 12, whatever age they are, Lord, you, you can do that. Lord, would your spirit testify to our spirits so we can realize what it means to be the right kind of salty? And who are those people, Lord, that you will place on our hearts right now that we need to be responsible for? Not enable them, but to also not overlook them. Lord, would you convict us right now by your kind grace, those areas of our life where we always want to push to the front of the line, those areas that we think we are entitled. Lord, would you do a good work in that and reveal that to us so that we might hand that over to you? God, would you help us know by the power of your Holy Spirit the cost that you paid on our behalf so that your resurrection has the final word and not sin, death, or shame? God, we, we, we also pray for those who've been in the hospital this week who are here this morning. Would you, by your spirit, would you comfort them and heal them, body, mind, and spirit? Lord, Lord for those of us who did not have life-giving conversations this morning between services, would you restore the joy of our salvation? And, and now, Lord, we just want to lift up verbally to you those people or those things that we are in desperate need of your grace to, to move, Lord. And so, Lord, we, we just, at this time, we, we call out what those people, who those people are and those things are that we don't even know how to answer those prayers, but we know that you do. And Lord, we will try to respond, Lord, hear our prayers. So gang, if you have someone or something that we need to be praying for, would you lift it up out loud and we'll all join together? Who is it that we need to be praying for? Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, hear our prayers. Yes, Lord, hear our prayers. Yes, Lord, hear our prayers. 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 Lord, we thank you that you hear the prayers that we've spoken. You also know the struggles that some of us have had that did not make it out of our lips. Lord, we thank you for that. That you not only hear our prayers, but you act. Lord, we pray for your healing of the brokenhearted this morning. We pray for your healing of those who are in need of physical and emotional and spiritual reconciliation. 
We thank you ahead of time that you are going to mend broken relationships, not only with other people, but perhaps those broken relationships that we feel that we have with you. You are able, you are willing, you are capable, you are the King of kings, you are the Lord of lords, you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And so we claim you now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray.